Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I'll be filling in for Tucker unless I read the schedule entirely wrong. A lot of news. A major summit has turned into a clash in some respects between President Trump and the leaders of Europe, the 29 others that make up NATO. It happened in Brussels. It happened today, this morning for us, in the afternoon for them. At issue, levels of defense spending. President Trump wants them to spend more, a lot more. The allies say, we will, eventually. Many countries are not paying what they should. And frankly, many countries uh, owe us a tremendous amount of money for many years back where they're delinquent, as far as I'm concerned, because the United States has had to pay for them. So if you go back 10 or 20 years, you'll just add it all up. It's massive amounts of money is owed. Uh, the United States has paid and stepped up like nobody. This has gone on for decades, by the way. This has gone on for many presidents, but no other president brought it up like I bring it up. And many have complained about it. The president also singled out Germany for criticism because they're an economic powerhouse, accusing them of funneling billions of dollars to Russia, even though they sought protection from Russian military from us. Listen. We have to talk about the billions and billions of dollars that's being paid to the country that we're supposed to be protecting you against. You know, everybody's, everybody's talking about it all over the world. They'll say, well, wait a minute, we're supposed to be protecting you from Russia. But why are you paying billions of dollars to Russia for energy? Why are countries in NATO, namely Germany, having a large percentage of their energy needs paid, you know, to Russia and, and taken care of by Russia? Now, if you look at it, Germany is a captive of Russia. You know, it's just funny looking at the American team. They're looking around going, well, this is a little different. Well, talking heads on other networks were horrified, especially this place called MSNBC. Former NATO ambassador Nicholas Burns made the odd claim that it's Orwellian for the president to say exactly what he thinks. It's just infuriating to watch this happen. You cannot imagine any American president all the way back 75 years deciding to become the critic in chief of NATO. I mean, it's Orwellian. It's infuriating to see this happen. It's diplomatic malpractice. And Nicholas Burns worked for Republican administration, Bush 43. Meanwhile, hours after the president's comments, the U.S. The US House unanimously approved a resolution expressing support for NATO. So the president's remarks were controversial to some, but were they wrong? Lou Dobbs. He stars on the Lou Dobbs show, and I believe that's exactly who I'm looking at right now from Fox Business. He just completed his show for Therefore. He gets time and a half. This is overtime Excellent. for Lou. You're, Excellent. You're all about dollars and cents. Delighted First off, to be with you. I know you were watching Fox and Friends this morning, which was prime time for the president's remarks. Yeah. So tell me, were you okay with his tone, tenor, and tactics? I think that every American ought to be thrilled with what the president did uh, in Brussels. He talked straight uh, to the leaders uh, of Europe and told them that you're, it's, it's time to start making sense. Uh, telling uh, Stoltenberg, the, the, you know, the head of NATO, that uh, you know you you can't just BS your way through another summit meeting and and look for a joint communique uh, that says everything's fine because it isn't. Uh, Twenty-four uh, countries are not meeting the uh, excuse me. There are 23 countries that are not meeting uh, their two percent of GDP requirement for national defense. Uh, they're depending on the United States. It's that straightforward. And Germany is the worst offender among them and uh, is the most egregious in its trade imbalances. Uh, it has run trade surpluses. Get ready for this one uh, for 67 years, Brian. Right. I mean, good Lord. Get so, real. So, Lou, a couple of things. Number one, uh, the president's a little ticked off at Germany in particular because mm -hmm. they put the hub of this of this gas line right through Germany, past Eastern European nations right. that are under threat from Russia, and they didn't seem to care. One of the explanations by the German uh, foreign secretary was, listen, we started building it in 2002. For, Russia was different then. So they've become uh, somewhat belligerent, so now we're stuck with this deal. Mm -hmm. Could they have put the ratchets down and unscrewed the, uh, the pipeline and maybe changed yeah. tactics? And we have this thing called oil and gas too, don't we, Lou? And wouldn't we be a reliable, uh, a, a reli wouldn't they be a reliable customer for us? It certainly would, uh, and, uh, and a host of other countries, uh, including some within OPEC, uh, which you know, would be also very helpful to uh, foreign policy uh, goals uh, in, in that region. But the reality here is that the Germans haven't lost their free will. Uh, they are following uh, their, their leader. 
And Angela Merkel has decided that there's not much difference uh, between uh, the uh, socialists of Germany uh, and the communists of Russia. Uh, and she and Putin, uh, despite her rhetoric, uh, have a rather amicable relationship. And Gerhard Schroeder is the head of the new pipeline that is uh, bypassing uh, Ukraine, among other countries, uh, and going straight and directly to the heart of Germany. Isn't that a cozy relationship? So, Lou, let me tell you something. So if you're Vladimir Putin, the best thing you would like to see is the breakup of NATO or friction in NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, we're having our arguments in public like we always do, Democrats right. and Republicans at home and now overseas. Do you think he is happy about this? And therefore, do you think the president uh, openly criticizing NATO works to Putin's advantage? No. No, I, I think, frankly, Brian, he's far happier about Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, uh, who are defending uh, Germany uh, and they're, they're absolutely unbalanced uh, and mercantile as trade policies and the deal uh, with, uh, with Russia. That's where the real, uh, to me, political fulcrum uh, it, uh, and advantage uh, rests uh, with Putin uh, and the West. Uh, th th this is immaterial to him, the, the little uh, nonsense from Stoltenberg and the NATO nations. What bothers him is Trump is talking seriously mm -hmm. about the issues, knows the facts, and won't let uh, you know simple niceties uh, prevent him from talking uh, truth they to have the world leaders. Right. They have committed to spend $264 billion over the next uh, four or five years on their collective defense. They have committed to changing tactics, fighting terror and cyber security. So those are positives, and President Trump has given credit uh, for doing that and changing things. And some of Trevor, President Trump's complaints are the same as President Obama's complaints and same as President Bush complaints. But no one complains about seeing Lou Dobbs on at 8 o'clock on, uh, on Fox News Channel. And Lou, just please invoice me or leave it on my desk so we can just have this settled before you, the summer be goes done. on. As you wish, the same place, same address, always the, and the same amount, I suppose, but at time and a half. Absolutely. Two Brian, networks great to be with you. back to back. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, that was Lou Dobbs. Meanwhile, President Trump is trying to get NATO allies to spend more on their own defense. In fact, he even mentioned up to 4%, which is more than we spend. I sense that was just a bit of pie in the sky. That could only be meant to counter Russia anyway. Somehow to Democrats in the press, this proves that Donald Trump is Vladimir Putin's agent. It's so upsetting to see that Putin, whose number one goal is to divide the West, uh, and particularly in NATO, has an American president doing his work for him. Everyone wonders why the president is so nice to this scoundrel, this bully. One wonders about that, and is it related to the Russia investigation and everything else? He could not be doing Putin's bidding more effectively if he were an active agent of Vladimir Putin and the KGB. All right. Uh, David Tefuri is a lawyer and advisor to President Barack Obama's campaigns on foreign policy. He joins us right now. So it's been a very exciting day. Sometimes these NATO summits are relatively sleepy. In fact, we got to be reminded when we're on air on Fox and Friends in the morning, oh, we got to take a shot of the president walking out, shaking hands. Not this time, David. Do you have a problem with the president voicing the same complaints as President Obama out in public? Look, NATO is not perfect, but it's the mo most important alliance that we are a part of. In the 70 years that it's been in place, not one NATO member has been invaded. That's really important. Also, when we were attacked on 9-11, it was NATO that stepped up and helped us and invoked Article 5. NATO is so important to us, and President Trump is not doing the work to note to to basically state that he can state productive co criticisms of nato but he should also acknowledge how important it is for a security framework the senators that you played who have criticisms of president trump's comments are right those your your older audience members will remember that it was nato and the u.s together that helped defeat the warsaw pact that was the soviet bloc led alliance and that is also so super important. Now, mm -hmm. what exactly what Putin and Russia want is for NATO to be weak, to be broken apart. And Trump is, in his essence, helping Putin do that by openly criticizing NATO, by being very difficult and hard on NATO, instead of coming up with productive right. criticisms. You know, David, you have a good point. If it was over now, if this was the end of his four or eight year term, you'd say, wow, President Trump was negative on NATO. But do you think there might be a method to this approach? They are getting them to spend more. They are focused on cyber terror. Do you know in the last 
last year and a half, they've come up with a 30-day quick action plan on land, sea, uh, and land, sea, and air in order to strike back against a Russian threat that didn't really exist five, six, seven, eight years ago. And the head of NATO even cited Donald Trump as giving credit for pushing this type of change. Could you just also possibly sit back and say, maybe doing something a little different might get us better results? Look, you're right that the head of NATO gave Trump some credit, and Trump deserves some credit. But let's take this in context. Remember that the obligation to spend 2% of your GDP on uh, your defense came in 2014. And it's a, a, an obligation that the NATO members have to meet over a 10-year period. So most of the countries that have not yet met that are not actually in violation right. of that agreement. That's important to note. But Trump is right to push those countries. But Trump should be more creative in his right. discussions. Instead of just harping on the failed to pay the, the full 2%. He should talk about how each country can participate more effectively, the types of things that they should be spending on. Pure spending is not good enough for us. We need strategic spending, the right. type of spending that's going to help push back our enemies, the terrorists, and push back and be a bulwark right. to Putin and Russia. He doesn't talk about any of those things, and a good leader would be doing that right now. David, you're always level-headed. Uh, you know, you're coming from President Obama's perspective. I get it, but you're level-headed and open. You know things had to be a little different. Different. But real quick, are you okay with him pulling out, calling out Germany uh, by taking this pipeline? Because Poland's upset by it. Other Eastern European nations are upset by it and are kind of saying, Mr. President of the United States, good job. Do you understand there might be a benefit to pushing Germany to actually speaking, uh, you know, asking for defense and also not going, going to bed with Russia? On the energy deal between Germany and Russia, Trump is right to criticize Germany. But, uh, you know, others have criticized Germany for that, too. That's not new, and I'm not sure why he brought it up in such a provocative way today. It's also important to note that Germany doing that deal with Russia does create some interdependence on the part of Russia as well. Russia now will need those payments from Germany. So Germany does will have some additional leverage over Russia. Right. I would prefer that Germany was getting the gas from other sources. If it could like come us? from the U.S., that would be better. Yeah, of course, that would be better. All right. Hey, David, always great to have you on. I love your perspective. Thanks, Brian. All right. Meanwhile, Colonel Douglas McGregor served as the director of Joint Operations Center in the Supreme Headquarters of Allied Europe. He knows it inside and out. He really served there during the 1990 Kosovo campaign. He wrote that book. It's called Margin of Victory. Colonel McGregor joins us right now. Colonel, we got 28 NATO bases. From a military perspective, and if you look at 70 years, there hasn't been a Soviet slash Russian invasion. And NATO is beginning to change its objective. Who would have thought there would have been in Afghanistan, having a cyber unit to it. Can you see the positive impact the president's making? Well, I think the, po the president's impact has been positive from the outset. <clears throat> Look, he's delivering a message that is at least two decades overdue. The Europeans have been essentially enjoying defense cost-free, for the most part, thanks to the United States. <clears throat> we bring the balance of the military power. We provide the command and control. Without us, there is frankly no NATO. And he was absolutely right to talk about Germany. It's not simply a question of funding in Germany. Germany effectively has no armed forces anymore. And you know, the armed that, forces that, you know, in Colonel, Germany are they hopelessly act, demoralized. And they tried to have, they tried to have a, you know, they have a volunteer service. They said, hey, guys, we have a budget. Sign up. No Germans signed up. Well, that's, that's only part of the problem. The larger problem is that the Germans, thanks to us, don't feel obligated to defend themselves. And the president has simply said, look, why should the American taxpayer defend you if you aren't willing to defend yourself? There's this thing called Article 3 in the NATO treaty that says each country will build adequate defenses for itself. They're not doing it. So the polls are right. The polls have asked repeatedly for the last several years, where is the German army? Because without a German army, any defense of Eastern Europe is frankly impossible. Why is it that these new uh, Eastern European free nations, when the <clears> wall <throat> fell, seem more uh, dedicated to NATO than the older Western nations? Why is that? Well, well, that's an easy, easy question, and there's an easy answer. Anyone, anyone in the world who's lived under Russian occupation, that includes the Germans who live in the former territory of, of East Germany or the German Democratic Republic, doesn't want to repeat the experience. These people want to be desperately allied with us for their own interests. 
so that they can protect themselves against what they view as an inevitable Russian attempt to regain control of their countries. And by the way, there's a lot of evidence to support their contention. The problem is that world warfare has changed. We can't permanently station troops in the Baltics or Poland. If we did, they'd be killed in the first strikes launched in the early hours of any future intervention. We can't be the first responder. That's the bottom line to NATO's problems in Eastern Europe. The president knows that. He wants to support them. He wants to reinforce them. Mm -hmm. But he wants them to be their own first responder. Colonel, I'm getting to the rap signal through my ear. Just trust me on that. Real quick. People are getting upset saying the president's nicer to Vladimir Putin than he is our own allies. Don't you think it's a matter of you expect more from your friends, families, and neighbors than you do of your rivals slash enemies? Well, maybe, but I think the president is looking for the opportunity to remove the requirement to treat Russia as a permanent enemy in Eastern Europe. So I think people should welcome that, much as Theresa May suggested. Right, although they've done nothing to deserve uh, that type of openness. Uh, they've been belligerent and they've been provocative. Sure. And they meddled in our election. Uh, Colonel, uh, thanks for your service. Great to see you. Thank you, Brian. All right, let me tell you what's coming up straight ahead over the next 44 minutes. Next, the left's meltdown over Trump's immigration policies is continuing, but are they going where voters don't want you to go? A new poll suggests that is indeed the case, and it turns out I'll share it with you, I promise. All right, the torrent of outrage over the president's immigration policy is virtually, well, it never stops. This is the worst case of child abuse, child neglect, child uh, mistreatment that you could imagine, but it's America's government doing it to babies. You posited that it's either incompetence or evil. I would suggest that it could be both that there is an evil desire to deter by making an example of these people. The pictures of the cruelty of this administration are a very deliberate part of this. Their core supporters, you know, want anybody who's darker than a latte deported. There you go. Although 100 representatives of 140 countries have come through the border over the last two years, that according to the acting director of ICE, who just retired. Now, meanwhile, on the left, there's growing agreement that ICE should be abolished. In fact, legislation is actually moving through the House. But is the public on board? A new political poll shows that only 25 percent of Americans want ICE gone, while 54 percent say we, they really wanted to stick around. What does John Summers think? After all, he was communication director for the former majority leader, Harry Reid. John, where do you stand as somebody that's usually supporting Democratic causes? Abolish ICE? Is that the answer? Hey, Brian, thanks for having me on. I, no, I don't, I don't think that that's actually the answer. And uh, as that same Politico story reported, that's not where the majority of uh, the leadership in the Democratic Party is. That's not where the majority of the candidates and other elected officials uh, in the Democratic Party are. I think you have some people who are doing their best to advocate for a position that they believe the majority of voters in their districts actually stand for. But I think the reality is, I mean, if you abolish ICE, the Trump administration is just going to pull it together and repackage it as something else, right? If I made an omelet using two eggs and a slice mm -hmm. of cheese and then decide I want to scramble it, it's scrambled eggs, but it's still going to taste the same. The calories are going to be the same and the ingredients are the same. It's just presented differently. And that's what would happen right. if you were to abolish ice under this administration. John, the majority right. of people on, on all sides of the aisle agree that we've got to we've got to protect our borders but we've got to do it in a way that also uh, respects american values and you know what the majority of americans want immigration reform and for the first time in a long time they want legal immigration to increase because there's opportunity here and oftentimes that refurbishes and rekindles imagination and fire throughout american history but john in particular if you're a leader on the democratic side and you see a 28 year old who's got a lot of charisma socialist who emerges after defeating crowley in the primary and she's saying abolish ICE, and Senator Kamala Harris is saying abolish ICE. She may not be a leader, but she certainly looked at as a presidential candidate and charismatic. So you have to, as a leader, so rein them in and say, this is not the message for us to be successful in November, don't you? Well, I mean, it's the message that they need to tell in their districts uh, if that's what they feel they need to say in order to win and if that's the position they truly believe in. I think it's great that we've got candidates who are coming out, who are speaking the truth, who are speaking truth to power, uh, and, and hopefully being honest with the people they want to represent. It doesn't always work for a national messaging thing, but all, poli all politics mm -hmm. are local anyway. So, you know, whenever you talk about one party right. or another not having a consistent message, that's all just a... It doesn't matter 
right? What matters is what these people mm -hmm. are talking about locally and that they're representing issues in a way that, uh, that, that respects the beliefs of the people they're representing. But, John, I think the represent. one thing that's not given enough credit is the ICE agents on average make about 60000 a year. They put on the bulletproof vest and you see ICE in the back. And now they go, out, they go outside and they're being protested against. People have found going in front of the acting director's house and protesting in front of his or her house. Who's ever going to want to do that job? And how unfair is it? They're just enforcing the laws that are on the books. Well, yeah, I think you raise a very good point there. And the fact is that law enforcement should get a lot more respect than they do. And they, shall, they all deserve a pay raise, frankly. But as it relates to ICE specifically, they're following the orders from the commander in chief. These are the policies that are set forward yep. by the president of the United States. Uh, he's the one that's forcing them to go out there uh, and do these terrible things, tearing well, away that's babies your word, from forcing them. You know, nursing mothers. <laughs> they're and not that sort taking of thing. babies from nursing mothers. Oh, that absolutely yeah, happened. They are and not. you know that that you has happened. You had me up until. Babies from nursing mothers. John, it's always it great to see you. You should run for office because I like your approach. John okay. Summers, thank you. Uh, meanwhile, I'll take that. He said thank you, maybe under his breath. 24 minutes after the hour. Next, former FBI agent Lisa Page refused to appear before Congress today. What does that mean? And what about Peter Strzok? What about him tomorrow? Will he show? Will they show up together? Believe it or not, that's an offer. We're running out of music, so I'll go to break. All right, former FBI lawyer Lisa Page was supposed to testify before Congress today, but instead she defied a congressional subpoena by declining to appear. Republicans in Congress are considering holding Page in contempt, and they can do that. Meanwhile, the president tweeted this. Ex-FBI lawyer Lisa Page today defied a House of Representatives issued subpoena to testify before Congress, exclamation point. Wow, but is anybody really surprised? Together with her lover, FBI agent Peter Strzok, she worked on the Riggs witch hunt, perhaps the most tainted and corrupt case ever. Joe DeGeneva has worked with the president on this, spoken to him about it. He's the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia and joins us now. Joe, Peter, her's not showing up. She said, well, I just got a chance to see the paperwork <laughs> at about 3 o'clock yesterday. I had to rekindle my security clearance because I had resigned. So you can't expect me to know all this stuff in just a few hours. Do you buy that excuse? No, of course not. Uh, Lisa Page is going to come, and if she testifies, she's going to lie, because it's the only way she can possibly explain the text messages between her, Peter Strzok, and the other people in the FBI. This is a pretty simple case. You know, notwithstanding the idiotic conclusions of the Inspector General Michael Horowitz, who said that all of these texts, notwithstanding the bias and the animus that they showed toward the current president of the United States, there was no evidence that bias tainted any prosecutorial dis decisions. Let me just say this. That conclusion by the Inspector General is idiotic. The bias and the animus against the president of the United States infected every single decision about the Russian probe, and it affected every single decision about the Hillary Clinton probe in her favor. Joe, do you think we got all the text? No, we do not have all the text, and I think Mr. Horowitz has admitted that. And what I want to know is, why isn't Christopher Wray, instead of giving idiotic testimony to the House committee, trying to find out where the hell those texts are? If they're so good at the FBI that they can figure out how to tap Donald Trump's campaign, why can't they find FBI employees' text messages? What do you think, Chris? You want to wake up from your sleep? FBI director Chris Ray, who used his time uh, at the press conference when this was released to praise the FBI in general. I found his press conference totally insulting and his testimony as if he's protecting something that he had no uh, no culpability uh, part of. He should be more outraged than even you, Joe, because what? this is an agency Why? he now heads. Ask yourself this question. Why isn't he outraged? And the answer is very simple. Chris Ray and Rod Rosenstein are careerists. They are apparatchiks. They people who believe that the Bureau and the Department of Justice people, even under Barack Obama, could do no wrong. And if they did do wrong, it's worth saving them and not having them pilloried in public because these institutions are too important. Nonsense. These institutions are too important not to have the truth come out. We have to know all these facts. Where is Chris Ray? What is he doing? He's on a milk carton, for heaven's sakes. Right. Uh, missing, uh, but he's certainly not taking an active role. Joe, thanks so much. It's going to be a day in which at least we get to watch Peter Strzok tomorrow. Evidently, he comes off smug and self-assured and looks to his lawyer a lot when the questions get tough. Sounds like Rosenstein. <laughs> Joe, thanks so much.
All right. You bet. Okay, here we go. Here's one of the men that's going to be questioning tomorrow, Congressman John Radcliffe. Always like seeing him. A Republican representative <laughs> from Texas and serves on the House Judiciary Committee. And he's going to, with oversight, will have a, question, have a chance to question Peter Strzok. So Lisa Page, Congressman, doesn't show up today. So you made her an offer. Show up tomorrow or show up by Friday. Tell me about this. Yeah, we had a lot of discussion about how to handle her failure to comply uh, with a congressional subpoena. And ultimately, uh, she's going to get three bites at the apple. She had one bite today. Uh, we invited her to appear with Peter Strzok tomorrow. Uh, and if she doesn't do that, uh, she can appear Friday morning for uh, a transcribed interview or deposition. And if she doesn't uh, appear before our committee, uh, by 10 p.m. on Friday, uh, then at 10.30, we'll move forward uh, with holding her in contempt. What do you know? Uh, it's going to be interesting. I, I did some uh, early research. It looks like 20 times since 1988, Congress has issued subpoenas. They've not been satisfied. And 20 times, they, uh, they have uh, issued uh, uh, threats of contempt charges. If she does not show up this week, are you guys going to follow through? I certainly hope so, Brian. My, uh, my stated intention is to do that. I think that red lines, as we've seen with this president, uh, need to be enforced. And uh, it's the one tool that we have to compel people to uh, appear uh, and give, uh, give us the truth and allow us to conduct our uh, congressional right. oversight. So um, uh, I'm certainly going to, to recommend that she be held in contempt mm -hmm. and that the matter be referred. Uh, if she doesn't appear, I certainly hope that she appears, but if she doesn't, that she be held in contempt, mm -hmm. the matter be referred, and she be prosecuted. Peter Strzok, on your, on you, that's what you guys wanted. He went behind closed doors first. Now he's going to go in public. From the best you can, without giving up uh, the, what happened over there and getting yourself in trouble, can you give me an idea? <laughs> of his approach and what we should all expect on uh, Thursday? Well, uh, there'll be a lot of drama tomorrow. He's a very important witness. Everyone concedes that. He's one of just a few people that was at the center of all three of the highest profile investigations in recent times, the Hillary Clinton email matter, the Russia investigation, and then uh, the special counsel probe. Um, there's going to be a lot of focus tomorrow, Brian, on uh, text messages. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of four-letter words because he and uh, Lisa Page used just about every four-letter word uh, in the book to describe uh, President Trump. Um, I think what you're going to hear tomorrow is that uh, Peter Strzok's not going to deny saying those things. He will deny that they are hateful or that they reflect bias, and he's certainly going to deny that they influenced his official conduct. Um, I was with him for 11 hours last week. I didn't find his explanations for those text messages to be believable or credible. But mm -hmm. the good news is American people can make up their own mind uh, tomorrow, uh, and there'll be a lot at stake. I just don't know why Robert Mueller doesn't care more. If he doesn't want, why does he off-ramp that investigation like he off-ramp Michael Cohen? Because well, he should be offended because it was once his agency that he headed up through two administrations, and they make the FBI look terrible, and he should be outraged. I, I agree with that completely, Brian. And I will tell you this, uh, other than Peter Strzok, uh, Bob Mueller and the special counsel team has more at stake than anyone with his testimony yeah. tomorrow because... Uh, Peter Strzok was the one that for the first nine months gathered all of the evidence, made all yep. of the investigative decisions that became the special counsel right. probe. And if he uh, uh, gotcha, acted Congressman. inappropriate, then, then he's, uh, Mueller's got a problem. Get some rest. We'll watch you tomorrow. Meanwhile, hey. a liberal professor is under assault by the left because he dared to praise Judge Brett Kavanaugh. He joins us next. Can you believe it? I got to tell you this story. You have a liberal law professor, very esteemed. He's being ripped right now by many on the left for writing an op-ed that defended Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Akil Reed Amar is a professor at Yale Law School and taught Kavanaugh when he was there. After Judge Kavanaugh's nomination was announced, he obviously was happy. And he wrote a, a piece for the New York Times stating, quote, the liberal case for Kavanaugh and calling him extremely qualified. In response, progressive writers, many of them, have been savaging them. You want some examples? Slate. Called this article complete crap. Geek GQ called this something we cannot air. But we can air Professor Amar. He joins us right now. Professor, you knew when you wrote this that you get some blowback. Did you expect something like that? Um, maybe it was a little more than I expected, but it, it comes with the territory. Uh, I love the fact that this country has robust 
uninhibited, wide open debate. It's the glory of our society. I prefer that it sometimes be a little less personal, but, um, but it, ours is a wonderful democracy. Why do you think a, a, somebody who's been labeled uh, a perfect judge by conservatives would do a good job on the Supreme Court? Uh, because uh, I think that a great judge is open-minded uh, and uh, changes his or her mind sometimes, and I think I've seen those uh, virtues in Brett Kavanaugh. A uh, great judge uh, uh, is a scholar of the Constitution, a great justice in particular, because the Supreme Court really focuses a lot on constitutional issues, and I think Brett Kavanaugh has studied the Constitution deeply. Uh, and I think he's a person of, of good character mm -hmm. and um, willing, and he's been willing to admit he's made mistakes in the past. Good. Um, an experienced person actually has made mistakes. Um, and, right. and a really good judge or a, a leader uh, uh, learns from those mistakes. So when you see Chuck Schumer declare it's going to be the end of the world, the end of Roe v. Wade, end of same-sex marriage, uh, end of uh, freedom of expression or things like this, what do you say to them? I'm a very staunch believer myself in uh, a constitutional right of same-sex marriage. I think Justice Kennedy, as the swing voter in the Obergefell case, got it right. Um, I should remind uh, the audience that uh, Brett Kavanaugh clerked for Anthony Kennedy. I know them both well. I admire them both. There are actually a lot of similarities. Uh, Justice. Kennedy was a staunch believer in free speech, is a staunch believer in free speech, whether it's of a conservative sort, a Citizens United, or a mm -hmm. liberal sort, a right to burn a flag. I think he was right in both of those cases, and I think um, uh, uh, that Brett Kavanaugh is a staunch believer in freedom of expression. Uh, people, uh, even Jeffrey Tubin said, no one can say he's not qualified. You say, if you're going to vote no, you tell Democrats on Kavanaugh, Publicly name at least two clearly better candidates whom a Republican president would reali realistically have nominated. That's what got under people's skin. Why does that work for you? Uh, um, well, and I, your audience should know that I, uh, I supported Merrick Garland. Uh, I, I voted for, for Hillary Clinton. But uh, the way our Constitution is set up, it's a process in which the president nominates. The Senate confirms ours is a two-party system where one party controls both the presidency and the Senate mm -hmm. uh, as a practical matter um, and has given um, an, a, us a list of people uh, gotcha. that, it's, uh, that, are, uh, that are being are strongly considered. If you pick someone else off the list who's better, I can't right. think of anyone, or tell us why it's uh, an inadequate list. Professor, you're just saying these are the rules, these are the laws, this is the Constitution, it's simple. Sorry you're getting this backlash. But welcome to our world. Professor, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. All right, 17 minutes before the top of the hour. NFL owners tried to put a stop to anthem protest. They did it in May. But now the players are taking action to protect their right to take a knee. We'll bring you the latest on that story next. All right, over the last 24 hours, the NFL Players Union has fired back against the NFL's May decision ordering players to stand for the national anthem or stay in the locker room. Now, the Players Association just filed a grievance against the league demanding that they have a right to kneel, sit, or do something else, protest. They want that right to be restored. Is that going to do anything to win back fans in the NFL? Jason Whitlock, co-host of Speak for Yourself, joins us right now from F F at, uh, Fox Sports One Studios. Jason, is this going to help or hurt the league? I think it's going to hurt the league, and I think it's going to hurt the individual players as well in terms of their, the brand of NFL players. These guys just don't seem to get it. They're branding themselves as unpatriotic in a sport that since Pete Rozelle in the 1960s has branded itself as uber-patriotic. This is completely off-brand and off the business model the NFL has established for itself and its players, it's bad business. If these guys want to protest, there are six other days in the week, there's 21 other hours on Sunday for them to do that. When you're playing in the NFL, your goal should be to make as much money as humanly possible for playing a dangerous game, and then take that money and support whatever causes you believe in. Th right. This thing is so crystal clear. I have no idea what these guys are thinking. 
All right, so you know right now, I have no problem with what the NFL did. They didn't like the fact that the, they didn't consult with the union reportedly before doing it. And the American public, 61% supported what the president, uh, excuse me, with the, what Roger Goodell's uh, league did. 33% disapproved. Jason, but I'll take the other side. Mostly white owners, mostly white fans, want you to stand for the national anthem. Mostly black players say we want the right to protest what they think is wrong in society. How dare you take that away from me? Listen, man, my father was a small businessman in Indianapolis, and the customer is always right when you go into business. And so you have to please your customer base. And so th this isn't about how the, a handful of players and how they feel. I'll push back. I want DeMora Smith, the head of the Players Union, to poll the 1,700 NFL players. How many of them want to kneel during the national anthem and want to continue this fight. I don't think it's a large majority. I think it's less than 100. And if that's the case, why as a union are you out supporting what 100 or less players want as opposed to what the 15, 1,600 other players want done? This should not be a priority because there are not that many NFL players that want to see this happen. And Jason, you're just talking hyperbole. The numbers don't lie. And uh, the average, uh, the average telecast got 14 million viewers last year. In 2016, it got 16 million. Attendance was down across the league. It's still a behemoth. It's still America's favorite sport. But you're definitely chipping at the edges, and it could get worse. My hope is they get together and they come out unified like the NBA did years ago. Now you know why Speak for Yourself is such a great show. Jason, thanks so much for staying up for us. Thank you, Brian. All right. Uh, meanwhile, nine minutes before we're done, Tucker's back right after the break. Increasingly, people are having their lives ruined by social media mobs. He talked to Greg Gutfeld about that, and I taped it on a VCR, and I'm going to play it back. So for decades, Americans feared that the government would invade their privacy and destroy their lives. But it turns out we didn't need the government for that. Thanks to the spread of smartphones and social media, at any moment, any day, any person could find themselves targeted online by some sort of mob. Greg Gutfeld hosts The Greg Gutfeld Show and co-hosts The Five. I don't like him very much, but he did a very good job writing this column on social media redemption. And he recently joined Tucker, and I taped it. This is all coming from what I thought was a fantastic piece that you wrote uh, for FoxNews.com. The headline, remember when we thought big brother, government was big brother, big brother is us. Yes. What we does that mean? We've happily embraced the role as our nation's hall monitors and our nation's policemen. And it, it, it's, it, it, social media triggers these two evolutionary processes, one to stand out. So you go on social media to gain attention yes. so you can get a partner. It's, it's ingrained in your head. And the other thing is the survival mechanism, group survival. So that means if you can find somebody and eject them, like a group, like a, like a sacrifice, y it, you save yourself. And this is something you're not even aware you're doing. But when you're on social media yeah. and you see somebody screw up and you just join the mob, it's kind of, it, it's almost like it's an evolutionary process to save yourself. And it makes me think, I think about like all these people that if you have a bad day, if you just happen to have a bad day and, and somebody gets you on tape, God help you. And, I, I, and, and my article, I was, when I wrote that, I was thinking about, would my parents have survived back in the day during social media as parents? You know, when, when you know, you didn't have a lot of stuff to entertain kids with. There were three TV channels. You had lousy roller skates. You didn't wear helmets. You're always, you know, you always, <laughs> parents were so That's mad. True. They'd get really mad at their kids and spank them because they were worried because you almost killed yourself. You know, you were always like worried about. Well, of course. Yes. If, but imagine you, if everybody you had a smartphone. You swat your kid in the Safeway now and you're in trouble. Yeah. No, but, you're totally right. My so mom, what's, my what's, mom would have been a meme. So what's the way out for us? I mean, clearly, Social media abets cruelty. It's it's degraded the society. It's made people lonelier, actually, yeah. as you point out in your piece, which is ironic but true. Mm -hmm. So, what do you do? What's the redemption from this? It's it's kind of I hate to use the word collective, but it takes a collective action to decide that you're not going to be part of the mob. And it's just it's just a moment yes. of a pause, a moment of pause when you are online and you see somebody that you don't like. It's really important that it's somebody you don't like screwing up. 
Let's say it's Joy Behar or Joy Reid or anybody named Joy, and you and they just say something that like and everybody's on them. It's like, what if you just decided not to? What if you decided not to demand that they be fired? What if you did? Now, it, this may not be reciprocated, and I know it won't be. T uh, uh, Tucker, if you are nice online, or I'm on nice online, it's not like Media Matters is going to do the same to us. We know that. No, no, but you're totally right. No, it begins with our self restraint. Right. Actually, will you come back on for Christmas to remind us of that? Because that is the kind of thing we can start 2019. I have. With. I remind myself I of this. Tattooed. I remind myself of this every time I, I I turn on that laptop and I go, "Don't be a jerk." Because once you get online, exactly. you are a lesser version of you. You are never a better version. That is very smart, Greg Gutfeld. Thank you for that. Thank you. Well, uh, Greg does not have to wait for Christmas. Greg Gutfeld will be back tomorrow with Dana Perino in the, this week's final exam. You never get that type of talent. Dana's very talented. Greg obviously is not. That's it for us tonight. But I have good news for you. You can see me tomorrow in a different outfit on Fox and Friends. Kellyanne Conway, Andy, uh, Andy McCarthy, Ari Fleisch. Actually, I might keep the same outfit. Then join me on radio from 9 till noon. Uh, Steve Hilton will be joining us from England. And Ed Rollins will be with us. But now, speaking of England, Sean Hannity's next, and he's not in his office. All right, so you're up in six hours. There's no excuse. It's like all Brian all the time, but great show tonight, Brian. We'll I'm going to go through morning. your stuff, Bean. You should uh, not welcome in the to country. Hannity.